Hi, I'm Austin Wintry, and this is the Game Maker's Notebook. For this episode, I had a very unique pleasure of chatting with Dave Grossman and Ron Gilbert, co-creators of The Return to Monkey Island. As someone who typically uh, chats with fellow composers and uh, audio guru types for this show, it was a real distinct privilege and joy as a longtime fan of their work to unpack the Return to Monkey Island, their long history with LucasArts, and the road that led to making the sequel. So I hope you enjoy it anywhere near as much as I did. It was a genuine treat to chat with them. Uh, I, I'm here with uh, Mr. Gilbert and Grossman uh, to talk a little, uh, to talk a little sort of Monkey Island and career overview. Um, Ron, you may not remember this, but we have met precisely once, which was sitting next to each other at the post-signing Video Games Live at the Microsoft Theater about 10 years ago. The lineup of folks that Tommy Tallarico had uh, harangued together. Uh, I had performed some music from Journey that night, and then we ended up sitting there signing stuff down in the bowels below the Microsoft Center uh, late into the night. It is, I think, the one and only time we've had occasion to meet. Um, so. Depending on how memory works these days, mine is hit or miss. It's either good to see you again or nice to meet you. <laughs> I, I have no recollection of that whatsoever. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad that I made just an unbelievable impression. Um, and uh, either way, Dave, nice to meet you. Uh, a, real, a real privilege to do this. Uh, as they mentioned, normally I'm in this seat talking shop with fellow composers and audio directors and folks like that. In fact, I had the joy of doing one of these a little while ago with uh, Peter McConnell. But um, but as a, a lifelong fan of your work, uh, they, they wisely suggested that I, uh, that I uh, be in charge of, of chatting with you all. So uh, let's just, I'd love to back into the newest entry to the Monkey Island a little bit. Um, and just get a sense of of your individual trajectories into LucasArts um, and, and the kind of road. I, I think Maniac Mansion would be both of your first uh, shipped title with them, but I don't actually know that for sure. Uh, so take okay. take a pick, flip a coin. Who wants to um, to um, kick us off? But just I'd love to get the, the kind of capsule summary of, of what led you to there to begin with. Uh, before we kind of dial in on the latest. Well, Ron, you were there first, so you should go first. Yeah, I started, I think, in 1985, I think. Might have been 84, but I think it was 85. And I was uh, doing Commodore 64 programming, and they hired me to port a game that they were working on called Coronas Rift. Um, they were working out on the Atari, and they needed somebody to port it to the Commodore 64. So that was the first um, title at Lucasfilm that I worked on was Corona Swift. And um, how'd you come? How'd you come? Like, where did you? Ha, what brought you to them to begin with? Uh, I think you know, ra random luck. I, I had been working uh, at another company doing you know Commodore 64 programming. And they went bankrupt, and so I um, I moved back to Oregon, where I grew up, because I didn't have a job anymore in California. And then I just got a call out of the blue at my house uh, in Oregon about somebody <laughs> saying, hey, um, would you like to come interview for this job at, at Lucasfilm? And I didn't even know Lucasfilm made games. Like Lucasfilm was Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Of course, yeah. So... I was a little bit confused by that, but I packed up my car and drove back to California. Were you a fan, just as a side note, like the Lucas kind of legacy of storytelling and whatnot? Like, was that one of those things that the prospect of that was exciting or were you of the mind of, hey, a paying job, that's enough for me? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I saw Star Wars when I was 11 years old, right? And that is like the prime age to watch that movie like you know when it came out 11 so i was a massive star wars in indiana jones fan so i was puzzled that they needed a game programmer but also incredibly excited 
yeah. um, that they needed a game programmer. Uh, got it. Well, so then what's the parallel lane version of that story, Dave? Uh, well, I came um, straight out of uh, graduate school. I had been studying artificial intelligence, and I was looking for a job that did not involve designing missile guidance systems or something of that nature. <laughs> And I went into the um, career center at UC Berkeley, and which was in like a basically like a hallway trailer, and they had all these boxes of, of actual paper, um, the way we did things in those days. And uh, I uh, was flipping through the binder of computer science jobs, and there was one that said Lucasfilm at the top, and I was like, oh yeah, those that's that company that made that movie that I liked. Um, that <laughs> sounds really fun. I didn't know they made games either, but. Um, it seemed like a good thing to do. And, and so I sent in a resume and um, drove out to Skywalker Ranch one day, which was kind of a trip in itself. And I had a terrible interview. I, Ron was there and, you know, he was the first one to kind of put his pencil down and leave the room. And I thought, oh, man, this is this is it. But I, I, I think I must have said some things on the way out that were OK because they hired me. And uh, so, first, so, so, pardon my interjection, but you're, so Ron, by that point, you were already in a position to be overseeing the interview process. Oh yeah, because I had done the Port of Chronos Rift, and then I had done Maniac Mansion, um, that game, and then I was, you know, at that point, I was kind of ramping up Monkey Island, and we were looking for programmers for Monkey Island. So, Got so it. Dave was interviewing for you know for for a thing for a um, opening on my project. So I was definitely interviewing. Him. Yeah. And it wasn't just Ron at the interview. There was like six people at the table. Gary Winnick was there and Dave Fox. And it was like a giant panel, me on the other side. And I'd had about two job interviews before that and was just like totally intimidated and know what to do. It was scary. <laughs> uh, well, clearly uh, worked out. I, I didn't actually realize... Um, uh, that that you were essentially interviewing for a role then on Monkey Island for all intents and purposes. Uh, I didn't realize that at the time either. They didn't say that, and that didn't it didn't come up for months actually. It it's so beautifully full circle though that the sort of catalyst for this conversation would be Monkey Island, and that I, I hadn't realized. I'm sure this is out there publicly very well known, and it's just my own ignorance. But I hadn't realized how kind of wonderfully symmetrical it makes all of this. Um, which is which is great. So, all right, let's then just get into the initial. Uh, and again, I'm sure you've said this a thousand times in interviews over the years. Forgive me for asking for some basics. It's mostly for the benefit of anybody that would be hearing this for the first time, uh, you know, listening to today's. But where did the initial kind of seeds of it come from as an idea? Where did the project kind of just the basics? I don't I, I, the originally back 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 in those days, you know, what led to it? I, I would, was, that was your most kind of senior level leadership role to that point, if I know correctly, Ron, as well. So uh, again, correct me anywhere I'm wrong. So just what were the path, the, the, as succinct as you like, the, the steps that led to that saying, okay, now we're, we're embarking on a new thing. Yeah, I had a, I had worked on Maniac Mansion and I had led that project as well. So it wasn't my first my first role leading a project. Um, I, I had I had built Maniac Mansion with Gary Winnick. You know, he and I were the one that created it, and also David Fox. You know, was a programmer and very influential in that game as well. But it wasn't my first leadership role in that. And I had finished working on Maniac Mansion, and then David Fox went off and did Zach McCracken in the Alien Mindbenders. And I didn't do any design work on that game, but I did support um, technology-wise because he was using the same scum system that we use for Maniac Mansion. So I was supporting that. And while I was doing that, I was just thinking about, you know, what game I wanted to make next. And... One of the things that always occurred to me is that, you know, a game like King's Quest, for example, um, sold way better than anything Lucasfilm had ever made. And I was really thinking about why that was. And hmm. the thing that really kind of came to mind was it was about fantasy, right? And fantasy was just a really popular genre at the time. And I mean, it is today. And I, I don't really like fantasy. 
you know, I don't read fantasy novels. I'm not a big fantasy movie fan. It just never really interests me that much. And so I started thinking about what what other genres are that that are like fantasy, that have a lot of the same attributes that fantasy brings. And that's when I really thought about pirates. So I thought, you know what, that whole world has a lot in common with with the fantasy stuff. I mean, no dragons, but it it was still up there. And so I really started thinking about pirates, and I started thinking about um, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, which is one of my favorite rides when I was a kid at Disneyland. And and so then I started just to kind of work up very short stories, little one-page stories for what this thing would be. And I got some good stuff. I wasn't totally satisfied with it, but I got some good stuff. And then um, the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade project came about. And I can't remember the exact circumstances, but I think that was originally licensed out to someone else and they kind of screwed up the license or something. Mm-hmm. And so it was brought back in house and uh, Lucasfilm needed that game made really quickly. And so they got me and David Fox and Noah Falstein together and said, look, we need an Indiana Jones adventure game and we need it fast. And so I stopped working on Monkey Island, and I went and I worked on the Indiana Jones game during that process. And during that process, I you know I was constantly thinking about Monkey Island, and I read a book called On Stranger Tides that Tim Powers wrote, and that was also very influential because that that book was about pirates, but it had a lot of like voodoo magic in it. And once I read that, I realized, you know, that's kind of what's missing from this story is that kind of almost supernatural element. Um, So it wasn't just an historical pirate adventure. Right. Um, And so that kind of worked its way into my designs um, going forward. And then when I finished the Indiana Jones game, then we kicked off McGowan for real. And I got more serious about the design, and then we hired programmers and artists, et cetera. So the other big piece of the puzzle that's missing in terms of that, that you know, ideation is, you know, because for me, growing up, the, the point-and-click adventures were the sort of defining genre of games for me. And so obviously you've got the LucasArts brand and the Sierra brand, and one of the defining... The, the, you know, two of the defining characteristics from a player's perspective that really separated them uh, was the sort of merciless nature of the Sierra games from a gameplay standpoint. I mean, just everything you did killed you and punished you. And, and and you know, if your save game was inopportunely made, you started the game completely from scratch. I remember there was a specific puzzle in Space Quest that would let you get so far before it would tell you, ah, that thing you did 20 minutes ago or an hour ago or whatever, shouldn't have done that. I mean, things that you'd be just crucified for if you did those kinds of things in today's market. And so obviously the LucasArts brand was stridently, strikingly different from that, from a kind of, I don't know if you want to call it accessibility or whatever the the kind of um, temperament of the gameplay, but also with the exception of the Leisure Suit Larry, um, the decision to to lean hard into comedy, which is amazingly still to this day, so a atypical of of games. Uh, so so, where in the process did those two? I know I'm asking sort of two questions in one, but those two really differentiating factors that that I that you know especially hold true for Monkey Island, but are, are a bit of a truism for the Lucas Arts sort of you know mantra. In general, where do where do those uh, start? Uh, was that a thing from the beginning? You know, because you didn't nothing about what you just said kind of hinted at it also being a quite hilarious game. Where did where did all that kind of gel together in the process? Well, I mean, I think you know, Maniac Mansion was a funny game. Of course, you know, and Gary and I just you know kind of like humor, and we wrote that humorously and funny, and and you know that that's what I like. I like humor. Right, I, I can't write serious stuff. I, I write funny stuff, and so, you know, Maniac Mansion was funny. Um, the Indiana Jones game obviously wasn't, you know, as funny because it's based on the movie. But we did, you know, put a lot of humor and stuff into that. And then when Monkey Island came about, I don't think there was any question in my mind that it was going to be a funny game. 
could just, just because that's what I enjoy doing. Um, the stuff about, you know, no, no death uh, in adventure games, that came about when uh, I was making the Indiana Jones game. I had written an article for that. I think it was called the Journal of Computer Game Design. And it was just about uh, my 15 rules for adventure game design. And a lot of those came from my experience with Maniac Mansion, which did have a bunch of deaths and dead ends and, you know, not quite as brutal as a Sierra game, but no. definitely had that stuff. And I was really starting to kind of formulate my rules for adventure game design at that point. And I'd written that whole article. And so when, when Monkey Island came about, Monkey Island was almost a test case for my 15 rules. It's like everything that was, you know, we did in Monkey Island followed those rules for adventure game design. Was there ever any pressure just given the market pressure that a game like King's Quest is exerting, like just knowing that that was part of the calculation for how do we find fantasy that's not that kind of fantasy and, and just the presence they had, the, the shadow they cast in the industry, was there pressure to make it more serious or to make it more mechanically similar? Or did, were, did the LucasArts brass, so to speak, just say, you know, follow your ins? Like last night I, I was talking to a, a friend at Naughty Dog who, who referred to uh, benign negligence like as the ideal form of oversight, uh, you know, where is that what that was like for you in those days? Yeah, I, you know, I, I honestly um, don't remember a lot of oversight on this stuff at all. I mean, the, the thing about making a game that sold as well as Sierra and, you know, making it, you know, fantasy without being fantasy, that, that all came from me. It's like no one at Lucasfilm ever said, you know, we need to do this because it sells better or focus tests say this. There was just none of that going on. Yeah. It's like we were just making the games we wanted to make at that point. Um, so someone once what described, time. you know, Lucasfilm as being like high school, but without the adult supervision. <laughs> and, you know, that's, and I, I always kind of took that to heart, you know, and, and, and I was, and I think that's why there was this, you know, explosion of creativity back then um, in Lucasfilm because we really didn't have a marketing department telling us what to do. You know, we would build something and then the marketing department would then figure out how to market that as opposed to the other way around that you often see today. Yeah, Dave, no, were you I, about to interject? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I, I, I was not um, leading a project at that point. That that came a couple of years later with Day of the Tentacle, but um, they're, they're definitely, like, benign negligence is a, is, is a, is a good term for it and um the the, the uh, editorial feedback on 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 your game if any um came not from uh you know sort of a, a, a figure on high but it was a group of the of the leaders of the other projects you know they all sit around a, a a table together and people would be pitching a new game and everybody would sort of weigh in with their opinions on it <clears throat> and then inevitably what they would say is um we want you to cut cut three rooms and five characters, and then we'll approve the budget, and you're good to go. And that's exactly what happened with Day of the Tentacle. And we we were actually we had heard enough to sort of put some extra characters and some extra locations in there, ready to be cut. And uh, and and after that, you were just kind of making your game, and nobody said very much about it usually. Um, that's uh, that's uh, that's amazing because it, it shows. I mean, the level, the amount of personality in those games. Uh, that whole run of really the whole of the 90s, uh, the tail end of the 80s into the 90s, LucasArts is just one truly superb game after another. Uh, I mean, I'm sure your perspectives both are, are are very different, but I can tell you as someone who was just so ravenously consuming those games, uh, the only game I ever sat down and insisted I, that my father play with me was Full Throttle. And he was so taken by it, he literally went and bought a Harley Davidson uh, 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 as a result of that game. Um, and uh, the, the, the Harley Heritage Softail Classic, which was the closest that you could get to one that had the wild tailpipes uh, that uh, that game laid claim to. So, um, yeah, it was just seemingly one after another. Before we sort of jump forward in time, um, obviously the sequel, uh, LeChuck's Revenge, is... Uh, you know, the sort of the next big high point in that uh, franchise. 
and um, super, you know, noteworthy for how it ends. Uh, obviously, that's I'm sure you've spent decades talking about that, uh, and I really don't mean to make this uninteresting for you by by doing a greatest hits of interview questions that you've been dealt uh, for, for years and years. But just, again, for due diligence sake, as run up to talking about the new one. Um, I'd love to know where that came in the process, if that was uh, a decision that was known from the start, if it was a discovery midstream, that kind of thing. The the ending of the game, yeah, specifically just this curveball that that it throws is just one of the more memorable game endings ever. And my, I, I don't mean to sound flattering or like I'm blowing smoke up your ass. I promise I'm not. It's just it's just striking and it sticks with you. Yeah, that I mean that ending um, <clears throat> just kind of came from nowhere. I think that ending, and I gave a whole talk about this. Um, when I gave a talk at um, at PAX in Australia, is you know that that whole ending um, came about from like fear, because I had no ending to Monkey Island two, and I did not know how it was going to end. And we were way into production, and I still had no ending for that game, and it was really starting to scare me. I was getting really really worried that I had no ending. Because I figured the ending will kind of come to you as you're as you're doing something, which is obviously uh, um, often the case, but this one just didn't. And I remember I was just I was sitting in bed one morning, just worrying about the whole ending of the thing, and then I just I got this weird vision of you know an amusement park and you know somebody riding one of those old timey bicycles and and. That whole thing, it's like, oh, wait a minute. And it harkened back to like a very, very early design of Monkey Island where it really was just an amusement park. You know, the, the main character was just in an amusement park. And so it started to pull all of those things forward for me. And then I really, I thought about, I thought about that. And then, you know, I went back and, you know, I talked to the team about it. And then I think all the details of it were kind of, pulled forward from there, but it was, it was something done at the last minute, really. Uh, it, it, never, it never fails to amaze me when I hear uh, a story like that, uh, you know, like you watch <clears throat> a friend of mine was evangelizing for watching. Uh, if you watch Blade Runner with Ridley Scott's director's commentary, uh, there's so many iconic shots and props and visuals and things like that throughout the movie where in his commentary, he just kind of says, oh, yeah, you know, we just needed some bullshit. So we just threw together a thing like that. And there's like so many of it have these very nonchalant or just in the moment somebody goes, oh, what about this? Yeah, that works. Throw that in there. And and just these things become iconic as the cement hardens. But in the moment, there's a lot. There's not this sense of Eureka. We found the genius bit of lightning in the bottle. Which is yeah, a I think funny that's, phenomenon. I think that's very common, you know, for anything creative. It's I think there's this misconception in people that ideas come out fully formed. You know, that you have an idea and you just blurt it out there and then that's the idea and then we'll make my idea. And that's just not the case. So right? it's the the process of creating something is a journey of discovery about what it is you're actually creating. And, you know, that, I think that's true of movies, certainly true of games. Um, they, they are not, or, or very, very rarely are they fully formed ideas that come out. I, uh, before we jump ahead in time, and I'm very, I'm, I'm resisting the temptation to have a whole side venture into total annihilation. Um, but because uh, uh, that's that I, I actually loved that game. I was also a big strategy guy. And, and but I will resist because uh, I'm really eager to talk about the latest Monkey Island. But I, I, I would be uh, doing a disservice to um, my uh, brethren, uh, Michael Land, Clint Bajakian and Peter McConnell to gloss over the sort of power trio that was the LucasArts audio department in those, those days. And just, uh, it, I, I don't have anything specific to ask you other than just your impressions of, of the musical development uh, on, on either of the, of the games and the kinds of interactions or any, any good uh, war stories, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I could dial in more specifically, but I, I'm also happy to leave it to my conversations 
with them on some future episode of this. But I like getting this kind of director's perspective on the composer's work. Yeah, I mean, the Monkey Island One stuff, you know, we had hired uh, Michael and I, di I didn't really have a, a big vision for what that music was supposed to be. Um, I, I, I talked to Michael and out of that kind of came the, you know, steel drum calypso type feeling for it. But I really just let them do what they needed to do. I, I don't understand music. I have no musical background. I, I know, you know, very, very little about music. And so I really just give them very, very high level directives and just let them do what they're really good at. So you, you don't remember like a lot of iterative process, in other words. Uh, it just kind of turned them loose and see at the finish line. Yeah, for Monkey Island, I think that was probably more true, you know, because um, the music was just a lot simpler in Monkey Island 1. Monkey Island 2, you know, used the whole iMuse system with the whole interactive music. And you know, we had a whole programmer who was just dedicated to nothing but implementing the, the music. Um, but my interactions with it were at, at kind of a very high level. You know, Michael would bring me into his office and I'd listen to stuff and I'd go, yeah, I like that. I don't like that feeling. It's not quite right. But I, I don't know enough about music to make any kind of useful suggestion on music, unfortunately. It's funny because yeah, it's just it, – sorry, Dave, go ahead. Just for, from the musical standpoint, those guys are are, are really kind of plug and play. It's, it's good to just sort of um, tell them what you need and then uh, – Wait, wait nervously while they uh, while they while they make it for you, and then um, grin when it when it comes in. Um, my what? my greatest memory is is um, though uh, was Michael's first day. Like he, I bumped into him as he was you know sort of signing in and getting paperwork and stuff, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm you know going to be composing stuff, and we got to talking, and he really likes to talk about technical stuff. And he was already talking about the ideas that were going to become iMuse like that day because he was like, what if, you know, what if we made the music interactive? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could make it do this and make it do that, that'd be awesome. Be like, yeah, yeah. And we could put these hooks in. We could do this. It was, uh, it was super gratifying to see that come around, like not for that project, but for the next one, finally, we got, got it built and working. It's awesome. I mean, it became such a calling card of, of LucasArts that, that, that these games had a real kind of nuanced approach to interactive music and it wasn't just you know this and then this and then this playing you know loops kind of awkwardly in succession you know occasionally i guess out of necessity but it's it's a really striking moment in time i loved when they did the remaster uh however many years ago and went back and jesse harlan and the lucas arts team at that time did all new live recordings but there was the thing where you could you know hit f10 or whatever and it would it would cross fade to the to the uh sort of canonical version including right on the beat to the original version of the music uh so they kept both versions of the score in sync throughout the whole game i remember that was i, I thought that alone must have been such a headache to get working properly syncing up a thing that was built for well, not the original for the iMuse, but something that came from, you know, a very different headspace technologically to the, the world now of live instruments and, and scripting through modern music engines like Wise or something. I, I just remember being blown away at the love that that showed for the game when, when it, you know, was 10 or 10, yeah, 12 I, years ago. Whenever that I think was. that's maybe the single greatest feature of a remaster ever is that sort of smooth back and forth between the old and the new. Fantastic. Yeah, it was so cool. Um, all right. Well, so let's jump ahead to, uh, you know, returning, returning to the franchise. What, um, uh, again, forgive my, um, asking some, 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 some basics, but, uh, uh, something I'm sure you put out there copiously, but, but what prompted the decision to actually, you know, ta tackle this? Oh, it, I mean, it's kind of a, a long and somewhat random journey, you know, in a lot of ways. It's, I mean, over the years, I've always thought about doing a, a new Monkey Island, and um, I've actually been approached about doing a new Monkey Island in a couple of um, instances, you know, by Lucasfilm over the years, and 
you know, for whatever reason, they just, they never went very far. So it's just nothing that I was really able to do. And, mm-hmm. um, and then I think it was PAX 2019, um, a guy named Nigel Laurie, who was, um, I believe one of the co-founders of Devolver, mm-hmm. he had, uh, he had said, Hey, let's get together and let's, you know, let's just have a beer. And that was it. And so I said, okay, well, let's go ahead and do that. And so we got together and he had said that he knew um, somebody that worked in the Disney licensing. I believe that was John Drake. And he said he he thought they might be able to go get the license for Monkey Island, um, but they didn't want to do it without me. So, you know, is that something I would be interested in doing if they could get that license? And I thought about it and I, I was skeptical. Like I said, there, there were at least two other times in, in the past that, uh, you know, I've been approached to do another Monkey Island and it's always fallen apart. So I was kind of skeptical. And I also, I didn't want to just go make another Monkey Island. I wanted to make a special Monkey Island. I wanted to make a new Monkey Island. And I really wanted to think about that. I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that there was a good idea out there. Mm. And by by coincidence, Dave and I had been working uh, together on another project uh, a few months earlier that uh, unfortunately fell apart. Um, so he and I were, you know, in contact. I think we were even on a Slack together at that point. And so I went to Dave and I said, hey, Dave, do you want to, what do you think about making another Monkey Island? And, um, you know, he was very excited about it. And so we, so Dave and I got together for a weekend, and we just kind of said, okay, if we were going to make another Monkey Island, what would it be? And one of the things I've always said was I want a new Monkey Island to start right at the end of Monkey Island 2. So that was this one stake in the ground. And so Dave and I got together and hashed everything out and talked about what we could do. And coming out of that weekend-long meeting, I really, I, f- I felt like, okay, I think we do have a good idea for this. And that's when I went back to um, to Devolver and said, okay, if, if you can get the license together, then, you know, Dave and I are in on this thing. And then, you know, nine months of attorneys hassling over stuff, <laughs> we finally started the game. Ah, uh, man, I can only imagine. Uh, so um, what... Obviously, there were subsequent entries to the franchise, you know, after you had had kind of gone on to other shores um, and that may or may not be related. And I and I, uh, you know, I I ask as openly as as is possible. But what about setting it right after the second one? Was that just because that's where it felt like that's where you left off? Or was it or was it that there was a very specific leaping points narratively that you were? keyed into because i the way you handle it i think is 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 quite charming like i remember thinking how on earth are they gonna wedge a whole game in there uh and then it felt so effortless that i i i I couldn't decide if it was one of those just like you described about ending the second one initially back in the day of you know oh part way in sort of cracked it or if it was built in from the premise so yeah i'm just i i guess what made that such a uh, condition of, of moving forward? I think it was that ending was very controversial. Um, I think that ending, as you pointed out at the beginning of this, is very beloved right now. But at the time when Monkey Island 2 came out, people hated that ending. Lucasfilm got angry letters in the mail. And these are real letters where somebody yeah. had to actually write the letter, put a stamp on it, put it in a post office box, that's how angry they were about this. <laughs> and, you know, so, so it wasn't, it wasn't this thing was instantly this classic ending. It was, it was very much hated. And, you know, over the years, it's like I get asked about that ending constantly. You know, what does that ending mean? Um, you know, are they just kids? Is it this? Is it what? And, and I just kind of felt like, you know what, if, if I'm going to do a new Monkey Island I, I really felt like I wanted to address that at some level. But surely it's not. Also, sorry, it's sorry. also just an, an, a really interesting creative challenge as well. That was what I read from it. I read it as 
the rolling up of the sleeves going, okay, you know, I've Houdini'd myself into a corner. So how do I Houdini out of it? Uh, and I, and I, it really comes off great, but, but surely your interpretation of how you use that as your launching off point was not in your head back in the day. Like you, no, I, no. I, that would, okay. Yeah. I was going to say that, that would have truly blown my mind. Something about the way you just said it made me go, surely I'm projecting that. And that couldn't have been in your mind at the time. It, it was a you know, big, when um, Dave and I got together. I mean, since that was a stake in the ground for me, that was one of the first things we talked about. And and I I, I believe, I mean, Dave can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was that that ending, you know, with it being Guybrush's son and, and everything came very, very quickly to us right. um, during that brainstorm session. There were tons of details about well, how does that weave into everything? that we had to figure out. But I think I think that one detail came very quickly. Yeah, we, we rewrote the scene many times over over the two years we were working on the game, but uh, basically that was the scene coming out of that first weekend brainstorm. Yeah. So um, there's a few things that you do. Well, actually, before I get into some of the specific questions, I'd love to know also, it sounds like you kind of built like a list of things that were priorities for you or, or, or you had certain thoughts of what you wanted to achieve. And I, this idea of, okay, it shouldn't just be another, but let's try to make it something novel and special. I think it's noteworthy when playing through the game that it doesn't, um, it doesn't lean on, it doesn't sort of lean on the, the intrinsic, you know, to, to invoke South Park, the member berries uh, sort of cynicism, the nostalgic cynicism of of like let's play the hits like it's it's very striking that for example the insult sword fighting is not a factor in this game in 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 a in a way that one might have expected and it struck me as a conscientious we don't want to just rehash things but i was curious how much of that is my projecting interpretation onto it or you know accurately that's that's i'm assessing accurately like those kinds of high level decisions how much of that did you kind of decide up front versus you know the normal game design iterative process kind of come to the ideal no you're you're totally format. right about that that's we definitely recognized that nostalgia was a good thing but there was already a lot of it kind of built in just because we were making monkey island and that it can be a trap for you if you sort of over rely on it so we wanted to make not not another monkey island game but a new monkey Island. the game. next monkey island right yeah was there any were there any moments of kind of waffling, you know, because it can be a hard line to see in the moment, you know, something can feel like, is this, you know, kind of lazy nostalgia or is this actually kind of clever repurpose? Like, did you find yourself wrangling with those kinds of dilemmas or, or did it all feel pretty clear to you what was fair game and what should be discarded or left to, you know, left in the it past? Mostly felt pretty clear. Well yeah, I mean, I think I think the you know the idea of not you know diving into the nostalgia pool was was something that Dave and I completely agreed on right from the beginning. But you know, little things we talked about should we include this? It's like in the original Monkey Island, you know, everything had TMs on it. You know, that was kind of a right. running gag that we had, and and that really came from the fact that at the time Lucasfilm just TM'd the most ridiculous things in our minds. And so adding TMs to everything in Monkey Island was really us poking fun at Lucasfilm. And we started to do a little bit of that in Return to Monkey Island. And then we just kind of went, you know what? This joke has been told. Right. And it was funny back then. We don't need to retell this joke. And that's why you don't find TMs on everything in Monkey Island. That, you know, that, I remember that as a very conscious decision. All right, we're not going to do that. Um, insult sword fighting is interesting because there is no insult sword fighting in Monkey Island 2. You know, it, it, it appeared in Monkey Island 1. It did not appear in Monkey Island 2. And then a lot of the subsequent games, um, kind of in my mind, they tried to recapture that. And I always felt like the insult sword fighting in Monkey Island 1 was just, it, it, was, it was almost perfect in a lot of ways. And I just had no desire to go do our spin on it right. um, and, and, and just kind of let it be what it was back then. 
Yeah. Was, were there any? Um, sorry, Dave. Were you about to say something? I was just going <clears> to <throat> elaborate a little. Just that the um, the nostalgia thing was there was a little bit of a balancing act there because we knew up front that this game was um, sort of self-referentially going to be about um, revisiting unfinished business, right? This is, you know, this is us revisiting some unfinished business from our past, and the story is going to be about Guybrush revisiting something that is unfinished for him and sort of comparing uh, the past and the present and how things have, have changed. You know, you go to try to find your past, and it's, you know, it's always moved a little bit. And so, of course, you can't do that without going and revisiting some things and that's where the nostalgia trap lies and the sort of start of the story you know he's he's going to melee island again and a bunch of his old friends are there and so we had to make really sure that <clears throat> we didn't get too wrapped up in rehashing their old relationships and focused a little more on like what's going on with them now and you know we're meeting them again and how how have they changed yeah it's actually very striking in a in a world where uh 20 and 30 year later sequels like Hocus Pocus 2 just came out, you know, and, 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 uh, or obviously all the, uh, endless piles of new Star Wars, uh, content and, and they're, you know, working on Indiana Jones 5 and in a world where there's, there's a fair bit of dusting off, uh, as it were of, uh, uh, dormant franchises. This one I think is so striking, um, as, as, you really do just kind of pick up where it went. Like, for example, the fact that that um, Guybrush and Elaine's relationship is kind of in this, you know, like it doesn't have this, oh, everything went to hell off screen or, you know, now we have to kind of bake in a whole plot around that. Like they have just this very kind of sweet and warm dynamic throughout. And I remember thinking this is this is such a noticeable dis uh, difference and contrast from the way so many other of the uh you know, franchise uh, re uh, uh, approaches that are happening in other places. They they try to start everything over. It's it, so many of these things are kind of sequels in name only, and there's so many of them actually are more obviously reboots. That's how I felt, for example, about the Force Awakens. It didn't. It it kind of reset the clock on all things Star Wars while claiming to be a sequel. And I remember saying a lot of these characters have gone backward, kind of off screen. I don't, and there's no real explanation, sort of satisfyingly why. And I, it was so. It was so like warm and fuzzy. I just remember thinking that they're, they're it, it's so charming. And again, I just I'm curious how much of that was just you guys going, yeah. Why, I mean, why would they? Or or kind of d wrestling with that particular aspect of it. Well, I mean, Kai Prince and Elaine, their relationship is interesting because the one thing that I did not like about the Curse of Monkey Island was the fact that they got married. I never thought Guybrush and Elaine should have gotten married. Mm. And when when Dave and I first started to think about the story um, for Return to Monkey Island, we actually had Guybrush and Elaine's relationship kind of on the rocks, that they were not really getting along. And um, it had a lot to do with Guybrush's obsession about finding the secret and um, you know, Dave had written a whole bunch of stuff, you know, for that. And when we got done with the first, I think it was the first or second round of playtesting that we did, them being not having a good relationship was something that people just hated. They did not like that at all. And I think a little bit of that was, you know, me trying to say, well, they shouldn't have gotten married anyway. I mean, they weren't divorced or anything, but... Um, but it just it 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 didn't really work. The the play testers who were playing the game weren't didn't really like it. I don't think it was working for Dave and I at some level either. And that's when we just kind of backed up and we said, you know what, let's let's just make them have a good relationship. You know, Elaine can still be a little concerned that Gabrush is obsessed, but um but 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 have have them do that and it and that I think just really seemed to work work well. Yeah, the general feeling was you know the guy brush facing enough challenges in the story already. Let's not make Elaine one of them. Let's have her be on his side and you know kind of make them stronger in that way. I, I, honestly, the the relationship between the two of them I think got more workshopping than almost anything else in the in the, in the game. Wow. Yeah. 
That's that's uh, that's really interesting because it, it, it feels so natural. And the I, you know I really want to talk about the ending natural of the game. Natural takes a lot of work. That's the <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah. It's amazing how sometimes things are just clear and you have it at the beginning, and it just somehow appears in your brain. You know, with one element fully formed, and then other aspects really take a lot of um, chiseling away. You know, to find to find whatever is buried in in the marble, so to speak. But I have to say that. It's so hard from from me as an outsider to imagine it differently than where you ended up, just because that warmth that they have adds so much poignancy to where you go with the end of the game. Her her just unqualified sort of loving nature uh, uh, of of Guybrush is adds such a complex emotional texture to the the game's ending which i i'll get to that in a minute i don't want to get in my head but it's, it's amazing how much it sneaks up on you as like holy shit that this this really kind of flipped a mirror on me and 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 uh really uh i can see why you said i don't want to just make the next one but to go somewhere reflective with it and, and the game as this kind of it felt like it almost had to be some kind of autobiographical look back at your own um relationship with the games and 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 i think her the tone with which she speaks to Guybrush in that very last scene is is so crucial to how it comes off. So it's it's fascinating to imagine that it wasn't necessarily always kind of uh, baked in that far. In fact, that you got as far as playtesting. Um, but before we talk about the ending, pretty early though. That was well, that's that's a fair. Yeah, I imagine it wasn't voiced and whatnot at, at those stages uh, in terms of the no. feedback. Yeah, one of the uh, it, was, it, was, it was it was a few steps above like like storyboarding. You right. Know, the, the, the graphics were super simple, and there wasn't even animation at that point. Um, there was just enough that people could actually play the game, which which you know happened like four or five months into development. So it was very very quick. Yeah. That uh, that that was changed. What was the total but, development time again? Uh, it was about just just under two years. It's wild. That's so fast by today's uh, standards, and the game is so it's not it's not lacking in in content, you know. So it's it's that that feels um, breakneck cool. from my point of view. Two two of the things that we want to do the most revision on are the puzzles and the story. We really want to make sure that every every bit of that is singing, and so getting that together in rough form as early as possible so you can just play it and play it and play it is is the good thing that the uh, good thing for development so to the to the puzzle question because i you know playing through the game and remembering the, what it was like playing you know decades ago the the originals um i'm curious your sense of you're just how you've evolved as the creator of these kinds of puzzles and and how they integrate with the narrative and because obviously you're we all change over the span of our lives even even from one year to the next we have a tendency to evolve and so i would think that the design sensibility has changed did you find yourself wanting to design things a certain way because that's sort of where you were in life and going okay that might be a bridge too far for this game um, or did it feel like just, you know, natural return to form for what seems really organic to this, you know, that you, you get the essence of what I'm asking. I'm trying not to sh sort of spoon feed it into a given, a given lane, but I'm just curious as time has gone, your, your design sensibility and how that factored into this. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm phrasing that poorly. I have an opinion, but do you want to go first, Ross? No, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, don't, your grievances. I don't think our overall process has changed that much. I think we just edit ourselves differently and better now. Um, I, I, f even even back um, 30 years ago, the way we basically approached it was we, we, we have a story and we have a character in that story and we give that character some goals and those goals are sort of designed to support puzzles, right? The puzzles are going to lead up to and, and, and solve those goals. And we would sort of break things down further and further and imagine um, what are what are the kinds of ways that the character could approach and solve this goal. 
And we would pick one and kind of look at it and go, well, uh, okay, but how are we going to do this with the interface? And how is the player actually supposed to come up with these ideas and solve this puzzle and sort of put our we put ourselves in a, in a place where we're, we're trying to empathize with the player as they attempt to solve the puzzles and we sort of figure it out that way. And, and I think that it's that empathy process that we do better now that, um, you know, with, mm. with, with the weight of 30 years of experience, we've made enough mistakes now that like, oh, well, we shouldn't really base this on a pun because we're going to translate this and it's not going to work um, you know, either linguistically or culturally. Um, you know, let's avoid the monkey wrench puzzle again. Uh, you know, just, just stuff like that. I think we've seen a lot of things don't work. Um, and so in a way that makes it a little harder because <laughs> we're, we're sort of narrowing our own box, but the end result is, I think, better. Yeah, I think I think for me, the big thing that has really changed is I, I want to respect the player and respect the player's time. And we live in a very different world today than we lived in 1990. There is so much that is pulling on people from a media standpoint. Right. There are so many movies and amazing television shows and games and all this stuff and podcasts and YouTube videos that, you know, what, what, what we want to do is we want to respect the fact that you have other things you want to do in your life. And a lot of people that played Monkey Island originally, you know, were eight and 10 years old, right? They, they didn't have much going on in their lives. They could come home from school and just dedicate their time to this game nonstop. And that's just not true. A lot of those eight and 10 year olds now have kids. They have jobs and kids. And, and we just, we want to respect that. And so we don't want to do ridiculous puzzles that are only in place to like make the game longer. Um, right and just and add frustration and it's just about about having everything just be very smooth you know that it's still fun it's still engaging it's still challenging but it's just very smooth as you work your way through it i you just said something that actually i remember thinking at the time and i i had forgotten because i am ex basically exactly as you just described i was around 10 when i played it i'm around 40 now and what struck me was it felt like both games felt like they were for me. Uh, like, I didn't feel like I was playing today's 10-year-old's game. You know what I'm saying? It felt like there was an evolutionary kind of band moving all in parallel uh, <laughs> there. And, and I, you know, was, that, that could just be, you know, my narcissism, I suppose. Like, this, this is how, how kind of them to make this solely for myself. But it... Um, <laughs> But it did seem like it was in so in in the same way that there was a certain element of your own. It was a conversation with a past version of yourself. It, it felt like that was extended to the players as well. Again, is that is that just my projection because I was happy to be playing a new Monkey Island game, or was that true insofar as like what you just said about respecting the time and any other kind of ways that might have manifest? Well, I think it is true, but but not by conscious design. It's like we didn't sit out and go, okay, well, we want to make sure that people who play the game when they're eight, you know, have a very similar emotional experience. But I think, you know, as, as David pointed out earlier, you know, we, we just, we're moving forward with you. You know, yeah. you, you as a player are moving forward with your lives and we as designers are moving forward with our lives. And so there is a, there is a lot of parallel you know, to those, um, to those two things. Yeah. I think, um, back in when we were all in our twenties, we were writing these things and we were writing about the kinds of things that 20 year olds think about sort of, you know, abstract concepts that, you know, from, from school and stuff. And now we're writing a little more about sort of people in relationships and, 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 uh, going a little deeper on that stuff. And I suspect that, um, the audience being older now uh, might be picking up on that. Yeah, well, this audience member certainly did. Um, but um, I, another, just on that, la just to on the subject of kind of design and the puzzles and whatnot, you know, um, I remember that back in those days, as you mentioned, you you come home from school or you're coming from, you know, you're in college or whatever kind of wherever you fell in, in life at the time when it, when the first two games came out. It was common where you know you'd hit a you'd hit a puzzle, and um, you couldn't 
figure past it and it would like sit in your subconscious for days. And then, you know, you'd have that 2 a.m. daydream moment of, of, of the thing bubbling up and you go, that can't be the solution. That, and you go and try it. And oh, my God, that was it. And for me, the, the one of that was the carrying the mug of grog to the prison cell. That was one of those things that it was the most gratifying experience I could have imagined realizing what was in front of me because it, it just wasn't intuitive. And it was also one of the few that required a bit of actual kind of real time behavior on the part of the player. Um, and it, it felt like the, the, the game, you know, had a light touch with, you know, unforgiving puzzles in that way. Although the, the, the whole bit with the, um, the drop of water and the distraction during the sort of algebra test felt like a little bit of that same headspace of you, you, you're on the clock and you have to kind of pay attention in a real time sort of a way. And, and, uh, it felt like maybe not a literal callback in any sense, but I thought there's definitely the design sensibility I can see um, in there. But overall, um, it was very approachable. It wasn't that it didn't require you to actually lean in, but it was. It did feel like it was inviting me to kind of have fun in this world, and it wasn't there as a like Mensa entrance exam, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and so to that end, uh, the two, two things that you did that, uh, three things that are kind of interconnected, but potentially that I, I'd never really seen it executed this way. First off, the the sort of trivia cards uh, thing as a as a as a way to that felt like a really natural way to go. Okay, you want to have your nostalgia and you want to kind of do. We can make it a very peripheral, totally optional element to the game. And I was just curious where that. It's obviously you know compared to all these others, it's a very kind of small feature by comparison, at least it seems like. Uh, but that was a nice touch, I thought. Um, it wasn't heavy handed. Where did that come about? Well, I knew that we wanted to do collectibles. Like a lot of games have collectibles and, you know, people enjoy them. And, you know, Thimbleweed Park had a collectible and you pick up those specks of dust everywhere, you know, which were little pixels. And um, people enjoy it. but. I, I did a lot of reading on collectibles and games and what worked and what didn't work. And one of the strong things that people were talking about that worked well for collectibles and games is if it wasn't just the act of collecting something, but you collected something and then there was some activity that you had to do mm. with that collectible, that it made it a lot more engaging for players. And so... Um, you know, the idea of the trivia cards came up and then it was like, well, you get these trivia cards and then you actually then have to answer the questions. Right. And um, a lot of the questions are about things that happened in the game you're playing. You know, they require you to be observant of what things had happened or what things are going to happen. Um, and then, you know, ex those expanded to some set of questions about the previous games and a few questions about, you know, Dave and David and I and our time at Lucasfilm. And, right. and it just it, so I think it's just a part of engaging the player a little bit more. So they're not just rotely clicking on something and getting a collectible, right. um, but they have to do something with that collectible. Um. Uh, it's sort of peripherally related, but just from a design standpoint, um, the the fact that you also give the player the ability to kind of tone down the difficulty of the puzzles, to have the kind of casual mode. Um, obviously, those kinds of things are not that um, uncommon in you know shooters and things like that. That's 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 been standard for decades to have some variation on that. Uh, but I don't I don't remember ever seeing something, you know, in that manner uh, in a game like this for just sort of pure narrative consumption. But I, I found myself thinking, because I played it on the, you know, I said, I, I want the full experience. So I didn't, I didn't dabble with the, the more casual mode, but I was, I found myself wondering, how would you distill this? Like, how does this, th so this is just, forgive my ignorance that I just didn't play it that way, but how did you even design for the idea of, well, we have to, this has to have a simpler solution as well, or is this a cuttable puzzle or uh, how did that actually work in practice? Well, Monkey Island 2 had the easy and hard mode. That was the first game that we had. Oh, that's funny. I completely that forgot that. that. Yeah. Well, there you it, go. It had that. And then 
when I did Thimbleweed Park, I also put in an easy and hard mode uh, in that game as well. Um, and so it just it seemed very natural to kind of put that. And I think that goes back to, you know, respecting the player's time. Um, and, you know, designing the easy hard mode is a lot easier than you would think. Because, you know, what we do is we design the hard mode. That, right. that is the game we design. Then at some much later stage in the process of the game, we then go through and we look at the puzzles and we go, which one of these can we just cut? Right. And we figure out, well, we're going to cut this puzzle. We're going to cut this puzzle. We're going to cut this puzzle. And you, you, you tie up a little loose ends around it. Um, and then you just have easy mode. And and the thing I like about that is that if you, if you play um, – if you, if you play easy mode and then you go to play hard mode, it's not that easy mode has spoiled a bunch of puzzles for you. Right. It's that in hard mode, you now have a bunch of brand new puzzles. Yeah. I. It's yeah, funny. I, I had completely forgotten. There. Say again, Dave. I was just saying, I, I, I think that's, you've oversimplified it a little because I definitely <laughs> remember uh, us putting a lot of work into um, the easy versus hard mode, and we had its you know a, the brainstorm page. And when we uh, you know the the theory was we'll design the hard mode and then we'll just cut some stuff. But in fact, um, when we went to do that, some of it was like, well, this feels like the easy mode puzzle, and let's make a harder one for for hard mode. <laughs> and some of them don't have. Um, just a thing is cut here. It just works a little differently in the easy mode, and we we, we make a thing a thing simpler. So I think um, yeah, I, overall, I think, it sounds like it is... Ron's version sounds like oh, we spent um, you know one day distilling out the the easy mode. <laughs> well, fact, his answer was, was the casual mode, mode answer. Uh, you're offering the hard mode answer, so <laughs> it's uh, it feels yeah, it's very on on point. Yeah, I think that is true. You know what you say for Return to Monkey Island. I know, like in Thimbleweed Park, um, that that was probably a little closer to the process I described. Is we really did just totally design and implement the hard mode version of that, and then went through and cut stuff to make easy. Um, where that wasn't, yeah, we we did go through and make some of the puzzles harder later in the stage for Return to Monkey Island. Related to that, I also. I, I liked that you had the sort of writer's cut option as well. Uh, is that also one that has a prior precedent that I'm sort of ignorant to? Because that I, I found myself going, that's a nice idea. Like that's, 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 I, I, you know, there's commentary tracks and things like that, but I had never seen the sort of this option appear. And I, again, I don't know what it's like if I don't have that checked. I clicked it. I said, give me the full, oh, the full experience. <laughs> So yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a new feature. I haven't seen that in another game. And it mostly just came out of the, the part where we were going through the script and just trying to cut the fat. And, you know, some of the scenes were just sort of too long. And there were, you know, some other extraneous parts and other parts of the game. And we're like, oh, let's cut this and let's cut that. But there are a few things where it's like, ah, oh, but that's that's really funny. Or that, you know, is like revealing of character and it's nice. And uh, I think it was that gives the we flavor. Were, we were talking about what well, gives more flavor. I mean, you know, there's plenty of flavor in there anyway. But um, we, I okay. think we were talking about the the, um, the three ex pirate leaders standing on the street corner uh, in part one on on Melee Island, and we were like, you know, th there's no reason for them to be there. They're not supporting any of the puzzles or the narrative. All, all the points that they make are well supported elsewhere. Um, maybe we should just cut them. It was like, yeah, but. We really like them being there, and I think that was the point at which I said we, we should just have a, like a writer's cut and take all this stuff that that we huh. would like to keep in, but is sort of troublesome for pacing purposes, and just make it an option for the player. And so we did that. So, if you if you turn the writer's cut off, those guys aren't there on the on the street corner, and you won't. Oh wow! So uh, that's funny. I I had just assumed it was like an editing pass, and that the dialogue was just kind of m m like you know everything was sort of accordioned inward a little bit. I didn't, it didn't occur to me that it would be whole interactions and things that are just fully. I mean, moved. that's, that's the biggest one, but there are also some, some chunks of some of the longer scenes where it's like, Oh, you get to comment on this. Well, no, we just kind of jump from a uh, minute, 30 seconds to 45 seconds and skip over this whole little 
bit in the middle. Right, right. Uh, one thing that I, I that that I just a small little aside that made me laugh. But how in the hell did it work out that Neil Druckmann ends up as one of your Bermuda uh, inmates? I think he just asked. Yeah, him. he's you know he's a, a big Monkey Island fan, obviously. That I know. And yeah. <laughs> He, he he just approached us and you know after we had announced that we were making the game um because when we announced that we were making the game in april we weren't totally done recording the voiceover yet we still had voiceover work we had to do so he he just kind of approached us and was like wow if, if i could if i could play some role no matter how small in this game it would you know be mean the world to me and so we're like yeah okay um, let's small it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of figured it would be a story as as straightforward as that, but I, I, it just was one of those that that I was, I and I missed it. I saw him in the credits, and I went, you know, you, you know, what? Where did I miss him? How did I not catch that? I had to, I had to ask him directly. Where were you? And what I loved was he immediately messages me a, an image of the of the um of the character and i said what i love is that this clearly is like the 90th time you've been asked this you've got that you've got that picture <laughs> at the ready uh to send out uh and and uh it, yeah I, I, it killed me um one last thing before i just ask you about about the ending and your kind of overall you know feelings on it but um i i you know i know that you you had a real kind of awful you know internet experience uh, uh with aspects of this and i don't mean to get into any of that that's all you know a bunch of undeserved garbage as far as i'm concerned um and uh but one of the things that i personally really love i've been a fan of uh rex crowley ever since tearaway uh, i had an occasion to meet uh him at a, at a conference in the uk and i remember just being really enamored of the guy's talent and creativity and and um and the, i i i really loved the way that you embrace like the, the 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 balancing act between old and new, but in particular, just leaning into you know, like letting his art style really kind of um, uh, become its own voice in the equation. You know, where it wasn't, it didn't feel beholden to the past um, in a in an obvious ways. Uh, and I'm curious uh, that decision process and and just you know, how do you decide? You know, I mean, did you even consider, for example, like an actual sort of pixel art, as we would now say, uh, uh, you know, fully sort of retro, uh, as it were, um, or something wildly new and different? I, I'm just curious, you know, when he came into the equation and how you landed on on that style. Yeah, pixel art was something that we discussed. Dave and I had the discussion, you know, right at the beginning is, do we do pixel art? And I believe we, you know, we moved on from that idea pretty quickly because we both felt we were making a new Monkey Island, right? Not another Monkey Island. And we didn't want it to be a nostalgia trip. And, you know, Thimbleweed Park was an interesting experience for me because every single review that appeared about Thimbleweed Park called it a throwback game. <laughs> right. that, that appeared everywhere. And it always bugged me because it's like, you know, there's a lot of really good things about this game, about the design of this game, about the storytelling, but nobody could get over the fact that it was pixel art and therefore it was a throwback game. Right. And we wanted Monkey Island to be a new game. And so I think we we moved on from pixel art very, very quickly in our discussions. And then it kind of became, well, what does it look like? What is the style? And I had known, um, I never met Rex before, but, you know, back, I think, in, what, 2010 or 9 or something, um, Rex had just emailed me out of the blue this picture of Guybrush that he had drawn. And it was really striking. It was just, it was it was fun and it was interesting. And it's like no other piece of fan art I had ever seen before. And um, I liked it so much that I made it the desktop on my computer for many, many years. And wow. when we decided not to do the pixel art, that image just really came to mind for me. And I knew Rex had worked on, you know, Nights and Bikes and some other stuff very recently. So I just, 
I, I dug up that email address that he had, you know, the, he, the email that he had done in 2010 and got his email address and I just mailed him out of the blue and I said, hey, um, let's talk. I didn't even tell him what it was about yet. I said, let's, let's talk. Huh. And, um, you know, at that point we were still trying to keep this whole thing a massive secret. So I had him sign an NDA and then I told him about that it was a Monkey Island game. Um, and then we kind of went forward from there. I mean, he was very interested in it. And it, I mean, if you talk to Rex about this, um, you know, he has a whole thing about how, um, you know, the art, the art is new, but it's not. It's like Rex spent a lot of time looking at all the color palettes for the original Monkey Island game, um, specifically for Melee and for Monkey Island, and making sure that there was this kind of tonal color match between all the games. And I think that's where you, that's kind of where the nostalgia starts to seep through, right? Yeah. It's not in the actual rendering of it, but there's a feeling that you get when you're on Melee, whether you're in Monkey One or Return to Monkey Island, that is the same. And I think a lot of that is because of the work that Rex did For sure. in, in making sure those things work. Yeah, I think there's also I, as a, a little thing and just seeing the Stan over your shoulder, uh, the the kind of the kind of like weird uh, hologram, uh, uh, like holodeck, uh, you know, grid that sort of exists in this other universe that he's sort of uh, waving around in front of was one of those that I thought that was a clear, definitive choice to sort of tip the hat to the to the you know. The before times, um, as it were, it felt it felt like a love letter, but one that was not afraid to package that love letter in something that is actually fundamentally new, uh, which to me is the best kind. You know, that's that's the best the, when you understand the source material and then try to take it somewhere fresh. Um, and he's just such a creative guy that it didn't. I wasn't surprised at all that I found myself really loving a lot of those choices. But I was just curious to hear you speak to it um, before we wrap up here. Um, I'm curious what prompted this, the letter that you guys uh, place, uh, uh, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of overt. Here's some of our thoughts, uh, because it was funny how I, I, your work speaks to the content of that letter so well that it didn't, nothing in it struck me as, wow, that's a shock that they would say that or feel that way. It, it felt like it actually, the game embodied the message of what you were saying. So I was curious and that's not a, it's not a criticism, therefore, that why you included it. But I'm curious what made you go that extra mile to say, we want to throw some parting words for the player in there as us. Because it, it's clearly like, a, 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 it struck me as a big decision to do a thing like that. Maybe it wasn't for you. So w walk me through that, because that was a a big statement. That, that's it's interesting. Like um, People have been commenting on the letter like on, on Twitter, I see a lot of people saying how much they liked it. And so far, I haven't seen anyone mention the date on the letter, which is uh, in the middle of 2020. And it, it's true that um, the letter notices the game entirely. Um, and wow, it, it was um, considerably after Ron and I had had our weekend summit, but right at the end of the period where contracts were being signed and we were getting ready to sort of dive in and make this game. And I just was sitting around my computer one day and I, I, I wrote, um, I just wanted to get a few of my thoughts down. So I wrote a time capsule letter basically to Ron and to myself uh, about what we were about to do and how I thought it was gonna go, where I thought we would, would end up. And then I filed it away and, I, and it sat there um, on my computer for most of the development. And then um, sort of towards the end, we were working on the ending of the game, and there were a lot of details that we were sort of trying to figure out, you know, what's 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 here and what's there and who says what. And there was something that just kind of wasn't quite clicking for us. And um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Um, I don't think it matters, but uh, I decided, I thought, now's the time to get the letter out. You know, I was going to wait till we were done with the game, but let me get it out. And I sent it to Ron, and he read it, and he said, we should we should just put this in the game. So it, was, it, it wasn't initially intended to be part of the game at all. But then Ron thought we should put it in, and, we, and then it was sort of a question of 
where are we going to put it in? We tried putting right. it like in diegetically inside the game. And then it was like, no, oh, it doesn't really feel right there. Let's do it as kind of a postscript. And that's when we decided to, to put it in the, in the scrapbook. What, what, Ron, what, when, what made you say that? What made you go, oh, yeah, let's put it in there. I mean, it, it, in the way the story's told makes it seem so kind of nonchalant, but it, it doesn't <laughs> feel like a small thing to include. I, I think it was, you know, we were kind of working out all the details of the ending. It's like we had built the ending and we were having people play test the ending, you know, the team as well as some of the um, external play testers were play testing the ending. And it was generally um, very well received, but there was just, we were kind of missing the mark. It's like there was, there was, it wasn't landing exactly like we wanted it to emotionally. And, you know, Dave and I just had a lot of discussions about, well, you know, maybe Elaine needs to say this, maybe Stan needs to say this, maybe, you know, you know, this has to happen. And that's when Dave brought out the letter, just, and, and not so much as a, as a, hey, let's do this. It was just, just to jog our memories, to make us kind of, think about why we were doing this. And and that's when I read the letter and it's like, wow, this letter totally encapsulates the feeling that the ending needs to have. And it was all in this nice little letter form that, you know, time traveler Dave probably uh, went back and wrote um, and it just worked. So, you know, we, we, we put it in. I mean, you say non nonchalantly, but I think when Dave pulled out the letter and I read it and I said, let's put this in the game. I think, I think from that point it was like, yeah, we should do this. But there was no discussion after that. So it was a little bit nonchalant in that, in that aspect. Right. The whole thing was so poignant. Uh, and I, you know, again, I was curious, it, it sounds like you had this notion of at least how you wanted the end to feel. If nothing, like whether you knew the exact narrative beats or something, but you knew the kind of underlying idea early on. Is that what I'm gathering from what you're saying? Uh, the, the specific execution of it might be the thing that was getting kicked around and iterated on and improved? Well, I mean, it went through a lot of iterations, you know, whether, um, you know, we, we kind of knew the whole amusement park thing. And I think Stan came very early, early but, but just how it all happened, it's like, um, I think at one point the ending um, actually happened uh, in that room with the giant code wheel, mm -hmm. that that's where the whole ending was. And then, you know, then the idea of like, no, let's, you know, if we're going to do this, let, let's really do it. Let's bring him out to High Street and um, move that forward. And then, you know, we had the alley. The alley appears at the end of Monkey Island 2, so it made sense to bring that on. So it, it kind of was an evolution of not not what the ending was, but how we really portrayed that to the player was very much an evolution. And like turning off the lights in some early version of the implementation, um, Stan turned off the lights. And, you know, you just, when he was done, you, you left with Elaine and then that just didn't feel right. It just it felt a little more poignant to have Guybrush be turning off the lights, and so there's just lots of little things like that, you know, kind of worked worked its way uh, as we kind of um, um, we kind of refined it and made sure that it was landing right. Yeah, we, well, we talk about um, the relationship between Guybrush and Elaine having a lot of revisions, but the ending was the other part really that got lots and lots of attention and, and rewrites. Yeah, I mean, there's some real creative courage to, like, just completely dispense with the the big grand showdown that it feels like you are building towards with LeChuck and Guybrush, and to just go chasing after and then hard left into this, this you know, the amusement park. Uh, for me, it really worked. I mean, that was that was why I was all too happy to be chatting with you with you guys today and really kind of uh, uh, unpack that because I it it as someone who you know through my different lane you know that you reach a lot of crossroads in your creative work where you go um, here's the one that strikes me as the more interesting choice but I'm certain there's going to be a loud contingent of folks that go what the fuck is this 
Uh, and and yeah, like, like, like there was at the end of Monkey Island too. Well, and that's why I was going to ask: is is was this a response to that to some degree for you, or was it just no? That's just how I'm wired. I like to, I, I like to sort of live dangerously, as it were. You know, I mean, because it it really uh, it felt like the authentic expression of itself. Uh, but it, it's also one of those that you just go in going, ah, well. You know, I'm basically asking for it, I guess. No, I, I, th I mean, there was no, there was no, I'm going to, you know, kind of make players pay for this or get back at them or revenge or anything like that at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I've always liked um, strange endings, right? I, I love David Lynch. I love Mulholland Drive. I love, right. I love endings where you don't walk out of the movie theater going, yep, that was the ending. Now I understand it. I, I like movies where I walk out of the theater and I then think about the ending for the next week. Right. To me, that says that something really well has done well was done. And, and going all the way back to like 1987, when I very first was, was building my Callan, there was this very strong component that it was all just an amusement park. Um, hey, you mentioned, yeah. you know, before Guybrush had a name, before LeChuck was around, but it was an amusement park. And you can see that. I mean, you can even see that on Monkey Island 1, like the vending machine, right? There's just a lot of acronistic stuff. And then we lean into that a lot more with Monkey Island 2, with the ending. So, you know, it being an amusement park at the end of this game didn't come from left field. Right. This yeah. wasn't something that we just yeah. made up. It's like, hey, let's make an amusement park and pull the rug out from under players. This, you know, I, I, I over the years, I've constantly been asked, what is the secret of Monkey Island? <laughs> and I have never told anybody. Um, and, and I think one of the things that, you know, Dave and I talked about early on was, yes, let's really reveal the actual secret of Monkey Island, the real secret. And so that's where this ending came from. And the fact that you're on your way to do this big showdown with LeChuck, and I think for a lot of players, they felt like they would walk through that door once the giant code wheel opened, and then there was going to be the giant conflict with LeChuck. Now we get our big showdown. And I, I kind of felt like that was the right place to pull the carpet out from under them with the ending because they were just so ready to do the showdown and then – it doesn't happen. And well, and I got to say the the I, it's it's uh, it's mind boggling to hear that you, in the earlier iteration you had Stan turning off the lights because that was one of those moments where the sort of one two punch of you know eschewing the showdown and then the next sort of substantive player action is turning off those lights and it didn't that was one of those where as a player I I thought it's not Guybrush turning off the lights. I am actually turning off the. It's like this weird fourth wall breaking idea of, you know, there's something beautiful in saying, this was wonderful, and now maybe, let's shut it down. Uh, like like there there was something about that that, and and whether that is meant as a kind of final, uh, statement and 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 whether I was projecting a very kind of melodramatic, uh, emotional weight onto it but it just it felt it was so touching uh, that, that i had to do that and even just navigating through the shadows um that that forces you to do uh it it it, it shocked me how emotional the ending felt as a result and i just thought there's this this um this is a statement the, uh, the, the, the earlier draft of that where stan was turning off the lights um had you as as Guybrush trying to turn them back on, so that there was a sort of a, you know, it was like a, like an action Don't make puzzle me almost stop. where you're, yeah, sort of no, no, wait, I'm I'm not ready, you know, you had to turn the lights back on in order to um, finish the final puzzle, but uh, and that was fun to play actually, um, uh, but I agree, it's a much better uh, and more poignant choice to have the player it, turn. turn it off. felt the thing that it made me think of. Did you ever watch the show The Good Place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it 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 felt emotionally a cousin of where that show ends, where the ideal architecture of the actual end is one that, when all is said and done, we now say it's on you to now step through as as a voluntary act, and it's a it's a solemn 
and it's a, it's a beautiful and a kind of understated introspective kind of thing. It felt, again, I don't mean to sound super overblown and, and kind of, you know, making it very melodramatic feeling, but it, that really struck me. I really liked the way that show ended as a philosophical kind of statement. Um, and this felt like it was coming from a similar emotional headspace of let's let the player kind of see themselves out. Uh, and it just really, uh, I've been to your goal. I finished it, I don't know, a week ago. And I've been thinking about that ending up to, you know, right up until the moment I joined this call. I mean, it really, it really did, I think, achieve what you were aspiring to. It didn't offer up a kind of popcorn or, or, you know, poppy sort of, here's the, here's that fun thing delivering on, you know, decades old promise of the whatever, it actually forced you to stop and kind of reflect in a way that was um, special in, in your aspirations uh, or as per your aspirations. So my congrats on that, because it really I don't I remember thinking, I don't know how they're going to end this, that that's going to feel like it wasn't just another entry in the franchise, like, you know, to, to alongside many others like it. And and I really from my I don't again, I don't mean to sound fawning, but it, it, it really it resonated. And I think it resonated in a way that if I was a 10 year old today, it wouldn't have. That's why I loved it is it felt like this is it's grown up. And I've, it's like, and it's like acknowledging that I have too. I could keep going, but I'll spare you. <laughs> um, any, uh, any final thoughts uh, from either of you? I really appreciate how indulgent you've been uh, with me, including, I know a lot of questions that you've answered a thousand times before over the years. And I just appreciate that we could kind of have it all in one place uh, for purposes of this show. But is there any other uh, Closing thoughts that uh, either of you have at the tip of your tongue that I've I've somehow left off the table here. No, I, I think it was pretty thorough. I mean, you you did ask a lot of questions that we've been we've been asked a hundred times, but you also came up with a lot of new ones and interesting <laughs> ones. So, well, I, and like I said, my gratitude to uh, my betters at. Uh, dice and the 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 higher ups that uh, control this podcast for for reaching out to let me do it i have a in fact uh I, I won't i won't delay your departure but at some point uh my my girlfriend who's a painter made a melee island a la van gogh painting for me for a, a birthday at some point that i think uh, you may have come across at some point online um, oh, a gorgeous painting that's on the wall in the next room from me here um, and, uh, so yeah, it comes from a, it comes from a personal place. So, so thank you for indulging me this, uh, and, uh, you know, upwards and onwards, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having us.